It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about creativity uh, as it relates to Franklin, Einstein, and maybe even the wise men, because in a place like this, uh, you know a lot of intelligent people. And the people I've written about have all been very intelligent people. But you also know that intelligence uh, doesn't really get you very far. A lot of the intelligent people you know never really amounted to much. It takes being creative, both as a person and as a society, to really distinguish yourselves. And that was the common theme I found when I wrote about Benjamin Franklin and Albert Einstein. Each of them, in their own way, thought differently, were creative in making leaps of the imagination, and that's what set them apart in each of their fields. I thought what I would do is give a little overview of their education and their uh, growing up, since we're here at a university, and show how that related to their creativity and then tie it in, I hope, to some of the issues we face today. But for Benjamin Franklin, uh, it was interesting because he was the tenth son of a Puritan, born in Boston, as you know, and as the tenth son of a Puritan, he was going to be his father's tithe to the Lord. His father was going to send him to Harvard to study for the ministry. This was a long time ago when Harvard knew how to train ministers. Uh, but Franklin wasn't really cut for the cloth. As a young kid, you see the rebelliousness that truly distinguishes him. At one point, they were salting away the provisions for the winter at his house. And he said to his father, how about if I say grace over this right now and we could get it done with once and for all for the entire year? <laughs> so his uh, father realized that it would be a waste of money to send him to Harvard. So what he did was the next best thing, or perhaps actually something better. He apprenticed Benjamin Franklin to his older brother, James Franklin, who ran a newspaper and had a print shop. And so Franklin tried to teach himself all of the things he wasn't learning by not being able to go to college. Totally self-taught. And he would take the books down from his brother's print shop every evening and read them overnight so he wouldn't get caught. And he's age 15 when he's apprenticed. And so he starts with Plutarch's Lives and Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress than uh, Cotton Mather's essays to do good, all those things you and I were reading when we were age 15. <laughs> and he even wants to teach himself to be a great writer creatively, so he takes the essays that um, Addison and Steele are doing in The Spectator, and he cuts them up with the scissors and rearranges them and then tries to recreate the essays. And he said, I taught myself to be a tolerable English writer, and in doing so, he wants to write for his brother's newspaper. Now, as I said, his brother is an older brother, so if you know older brothers, you know, it's not very likely he's going to have young Ben Franklin write for the newspaper. And so Benjamin Franklin ends up having to disguise his handwriting and write under a pseudonym in order to get his pieces in the paper. And here's a kid at age 15 who's never really left Boston, kind of a naughty lad, grew up on the docks of Boston, and he pretends to be a new character called Silence Do Good, a widowed elderly woman who lives in the countryside and is courted by a minister. It's an absolute triumph of the imagination. And it is the first burst of creativity you see in this young kid. And as you read the Silence Do Good essays, you can see the values that come from his creativity. The very first Silence Do Good essay, he writes, he says, he wants to introduce himself, or more precisely, she's introducing herself in Franklin's writing, and she says, I have a natural aversion to tyranny, and any trampling in the rights of my fellow citizens makes my blood boil exceedingly. That's how you know I'm an American. And the second Silence Do Good, he makes fun of the connection between church and state in the theocracy of Massachusetts, making fun of Governor Dudley, who had been a minister, saying anybody who uh, goes from the clergy into government will simply try to steal your money in two different ways, first under the guise of God and then under the guise of taxes. <laughs> I particularly like the fourth Silence Do Good essay, The Creativity There, because at that point he realizes his friends are going to Harvard, so he writes about how Harvard only knows how to turn out dunces and blockheads who have learned to enter a room genteelly, something they could have learned less expensively in dancing school. So his brother, James, not being a total dunce or blockhead, 
finally figures out that this is young Ben writing these essays. So to cut the story short a bit, Benjamin Franklin becomes the most famous 17-year-old runaway in colonial America, running away from Boston, coming through here, coming through Perth Amboy, through New Jersey, finally landing at the Market Street Wharf in uh, Philadelphia, straggling all wet and bedraggled up Market Street, uh, a couple of coins in his pocket. He uses one of them to tip the boatman, another to buy those three puffy rolls, gives away one of the rolls to a woman on the boat who is very hungry. And here's where you get to the real creativity, I think, of Franklin, is this notion of inventing yourself. He says, when you're very poor, you're always much more generous than when you're very rich. Because you want people to think you're rich, so you pretend to be rich. And in America, you can become who you pretend to be. You become the mask you wear. One of the great insights of American creativity is that we get to create a new day and generation, new people each, each time around. For example, in Philadelphia, once he started his own little print shop, as a young tradesman, he forms a club called the Leather Apron Club. The Leather Apron Club is, what, is for the middle class people, the people who wear leather aprons that keep shop or tradesmen or artisans. And uh, he wanted to distinguish it between the gentlemen's clubs of people who were of leisure, but really the hardworking, what he called, we the middling people. And so they make a list in the Leather Apron Club of the various virtues you need to have to be a uh, good citizen. And if you've read the autobiography, you know the list. It's industry, honesty, frugality. And being very geeky, he marks every week how, if he's made a mistake in any one of these virtues. And eventually, he transfers his chart of virtues to an ivory slate so he can wipe it clean each week, saying that's part of being creative in America is you get a clean try each week. And finally, he comes up one week with a clean slate, which is where the cliche comes from. He's uh, gotten all 12 of the virtues right, and he shows it off to the other people in the Leather Apron Club. And one of them very kindly informs him, he says, that he's missing a virtue that he might want to practice. Franklin says, what's that? And the friend says, humility. You might want to try that one. <laughs> and here's where you get to, once again, the creativity of inventing yourself and becoming who you pretend to be. He said, I was never very good at the virtue of humility. I could never master it. But I was very good at the pretense of humility. I could fake it very well. <laughs> this is something I'm sure at faculty clubs around the country is a <laughs> refined art. But what his insight was, and I learned that the pretense of humility was just as useful as the reality of humility. It caused you to listen to the person next to you, try to find common ground into what you were thinking, and that was the foundation of the tolerant democracy we were trying to create in this new world. So you're creating something new, a whole new set of institutions out of whole cloth, a notion of a tolerant democracy in a place like Philadelphia where there are Moravians and Jews and Anglicans and Quakers, and each one has to be listened to as you create this. This was, uh, some uh, great intellectual historian said, the only thing that Franklin really did creatively was to introduce the notion of a uh, good-natured tolerance. Well, with all due respect to that university, or that professor who actually taught here at Princeton, so I won't say his name, um, the idea of creating communities based on good-natured tolerance was one of the great leaps forward in that period of the 18th century. It transforms what society can be about. So you see all the institutions that young Benjamin Franklin creates uh, as a tradesman. The library, of, uh, the free library, the first free library there, the militia, the street sweeping corps, the academy for the education of youth that becomes the University of Pennsylvania. All of these things are done by associations, by groups of young tradesmen, middle class people, who say we want to create a new set of institutions. It's very different in some ways than Einstein's creativity, but it ties in, and I think, to the two types of creativity we need today. For Einstein, his creativity was much different. It was a very solitary, great leaps of the imagination, questioning at all times the conventional wisdom and thinking out of the box. The good news for those of us parents or those of us teaching young people is that Einstein was no Einstein when he was a kid. He was very slow in learning how to talk, so slow that they consult a doctor 
in the family, and they call him de Deporte, the dopey one in the family. Uh, but it, and he was also so rebellious that he gets kicked out of one school, and another headmaster amuses us by saying, this Albert Einstein, he'll never amount to much. But I think it was both the rebelliousness and the slow verbal learning ability that lead into the creativity you see in Einstein. First of all, the rebelliousness caused him at every single moment to question every premise, every given. The notion that time marches along second by second. Everything that was totally given in science then, he says, but how do we know it? This did not make him popular in school. The German school system of Munich did not value students who questioned authority. But in some ways, that's something we have to learn, both in our schools and in our No Child Left Behind age, and obviously in a university, is those who question the conventional thinking should be nurtured the way an Einstein or a Benjamin Franklin was. Secondly, the slow verbal learning ability caused him to think in pictures. He never thought in words, but he always visualized things. He would do what he called visual thought experiments. It's what you and I call daydreaming, but if you're Einstein, you get to call them visual thought experiments. <laughs> Uh, and he's always trying to picture how things work. For example, at age six, his father gives him a compass, and he watches as the compass needle twitches and points north. He says day after day, he would go out into the woods, and he'd turn it, and it would twitch, and he couldn't figure out. Nothing was touching the needle. How does a force field? He's trying to visualize how a force field works. He said for days on end, it kept him mesmerized. Now, you and I probably remember getting a compass when we were kids, and you say, hey, well, look, cool, it points north, and, you know, a minute later, you're on to something else, like, oh, look, a dead squirrel, and you forget all about the compass. <laughs> Until his deathbed, a few blocks away from here in Princeton Hospital, he is still writing field equations that try to explain a force field. He's still trying to visualize what it looks like. He also, one of the great myths is that he was uh, not very good in math. He was great in math, not good in getting good grades in math, but great in math because he realized that equations are just the good Lord's brushstroke for painting something in physical reality. So he could picture what a mathematical equation was like. I'll say the story sometimes about our daughter uh, who was doing math. And I said, gee, you know, you got that wrong. Just look at the equation. It's got to swoop up like that. She said, what do you mean? I said, well, the equation is just, you know, painting something in reality. He said, oh, no, that's not the way they teach math these days. We're not supposed to visualize it. And so, but Einstein visualized it so well that when he was 17 years old, just as rebellious as Franklin is that age, Einstein was visualizing Maxwell's equations. We were at dinner early this evening, and Sam Wong and I and some others were talking about Maxwell's equations, which, as you know, are just a set of equations that describe a light wave or any electromagnetic wave. But if you look at Maxwell's equations and visualize them, or if you're Einstein and you look at them and visualize them, even at age 17, something amazing occurs to you, which is those waves have to travel at a constant speed. No matter what your frame of reference, no matter how you're traveling, the light wave will always travel at a speed approximately 187,000 miles per second or so. And Einstein, at age 17, is still trying to picture it, and he says to himself and to his friends, what if you caught up with the light wave? What if you rode along with the light beam and went just as fast as the wave? Wouldn't the wave appear stationary to you? But Maxwell's equations don't allow for that. And he said it caused him great anxiety. It caused him to worry so much that his palms would be sweating as he tried to figure this out. Now, I remember what was causing my palms to sweat growing up in New Orleans at age 17, and it wasn't Maxwell's equations. <laughs> but this is why he's Einstein. These things are, you know, he's trying to figure this out. And even though, as we talked earlier this evening, there's so many experimentalists like Michael Nicholson and Morley doing, you know, experiments showing that the light travels at a constant speed, he wants to visualize it and derive it from Maxwell's equations. And uh, since his teachers are not appreciative of this, and he basically gets kicked out of the gymnasium in Munich, he runs away, just like my friend Benjamin Franklin, also has that rebelliousness, runs away at age 17 and goes off to uh, Italy and then Switzerland, where he thinks he can get a more creative and imaginative education. And he applies to the second best college in Zurich, the Zurich Polytechnic, and he gets rejected. 
Now, I don't know if the admissions director here at Princeton is here, but I've always wanted to meet that admissions director at the Zurich Polytech who turned down Einstein. But fortunately for his reputation and Einstein's, Einstein gets accepted the next year after what we would call a gap year. He goes wandering around and teaches school a little bit. And he does moderately well at the Zurich Polytech, but he still has that roots of that creativity where he's questioning authority every step of the way and trying to visualize things. With Professor Weber, he, the physics professor, he keeps saying, but what if you caught, you know, try to visualize Maxwell. What if you caught up with him? And finally Weber says, I don't teach Maxwell's equations. They're too theoretical. And so Einstein quits calling him Herr Professor and starts calling him Herr Weber. And Weber refuses to have anything to do with him. And then math professor Minkowski uh, teaches by rote, so Einstein gets a friend to take notes for him in math class and doesn't even show up. And uh, we were talking earlier about how he's a horrible experimentalist, Einstein. So at one point he throws away the notes in Professor Jean Pernay's class, the experimental instructor, and he blows up the equipment, causing him to be put on academic probation and fail the course. Uh, and so Pernay goes down in history as the one person to fail Einstein in a physics course. But all the way through, he's doing that great questioning of why. How do we know things? Trying to make the mental leap where he thinks of things out of the box. That doesn't serve him all that well, so he becomes the only graduate of the Zurich Polytech 1900 class in physics or math who can't get a job. He's not offered a graduate student's fellowship or a teaching fellowship or an assistant professorship. In fact, he applies to, school, to teach both in colleges and at 19 different high schools around Switzerland and Germany. He gets turned down by all and basically spends two years unemployed until the kid who took notes for him in math class gets him a job as a third class examiner in the Swiss patent office in Bern, Switzerland. Third class because his doctorate had been, dissertation had been rejected twice and you couldn't be a second class or first class examiner without a doctorate. So he's doing the lowest level things at the patent office, working six days a week on a stool. But lest we feel sorry for him, I think that too was part of the creativity. With all due respect to a university, Einstein at that age would not have been a very good acolyte in the academy, you know, trying to please a senior professor and teach the conventional wisdom. Instead, he's got this job in which his boss is telling him exactly what he wants to hear which is whenever you get a patent application, question every premise, challenge every assumption. Try to visualize how it would work in practice. And most of the applications he's getting are um, for synchronizing clocks, because Switzerland has just gone on standard time zones, and the Swiss, if you know Swiss people, tend to be rather Swiss, and they really, really care that if it strikes seven in Zurich, it's going to strike seven at that exact same instant in Bern, and in order to synchronize two clocks, you've got to send a signal between them, and the signal generally travels at the speed of light in these applications, whether it's a radio signal, electric signal, a light signal. And there you've got this patent clerk who's still saying, well, what if I caught up with the light beam? What would it look like? <laughs> and finally, one day, he says to a friend of his in the patent office, Michelle Besso, I've got it. I've figured it out. His friend says, well, what's the solution? And it's not, as I say, derived from all the fits you and all the experiments on the speed of light. He simply says, do the thought experiment. It depends on what you mean by simultaneity. Now, Sean has mentioned Washington. You know, if you say that in Washington, it sort of sounds like Bill Clinton. It depends on your definition of what is simultaneous. <laughs> but he's saying, no, how do we know something is simultaneous? Now, you and I do not question what does it mean to be simultaneous, right? We say it means it happens at the same time as something else. But if you're Einstein, you say, well, how do we know? And he says, you know, we need a light signal from two distant events to hit us. And he says, one definition of simultaneous is if two events happen and somebody's standing halfway in between, the light from both of those events hits that person at the same time. And that person says, those are simultaneous. And Besso says, yes. I mean, it's all in May of 1905. We know it from all the letters, what happens. And Einstein says, imagine lightning striking both ends of a fast-moving train. Now, once again, it's a thought experiment. This is not an experiment you can do. But he said, lightning strikes both ends of a fast-moving train. And there's a guy on the platform, halfway in between. He sees the light at the exact same time from both strikes. He says the strikes are simultaneous. And then Einstein says, but imagine there's a woman on the train, exactly halfway on the train. But the train is moving forward real fast. In the nanosecond, it takes that train, the light to come. She'll have moved forward a bit. 
she will see the lightning strike in front, the light from it first, and she'll say, no, the one in front happened first. All the special theory of relativity says is that neither one of them is right and neither one of them is wrong. What's simultaneous is relative, depending on your state of motion. And from that, from that it's pretty easy to make the leap that time is relative, depending on your state of motion. Now, ever since you know, Newton began the Principia by telling us that time marches along second by second, irrespective of how we observe it, nobody had questioned that premise. But Einstein basically makes the greatest conceptual leap of that time in physics, overdoing you know, Lorentz and uh, Poincaré and others who are coming close to it but don't figure out that time is relative. You don't need the ether. You don't need to explain it by contractions. He does it by a pure conceptual imaginative leap by thinking differently. And that is the case for all of Einstein's great breakthroughs. Even uh, general relativity, uh, which is the other grand breakthrough, he does it by beginning with just a simple thought experiment, which is what would it be like to be in an enclosed chamber? And what would you feel if the enclosed chamber is in a gravitational field, like on the surface of the Earth? You'd feel what I feel. Your feet are pressed to the floor, you take something out of your pocket and you let it go. It falls to the floor at an accelerated rate. And then he says, what would it be like to be in that enclosed chamber deep in outer space where there's no gravity, but is being accelerated upward real fast? He said you'd feel the same thing. Your feet would be pressed to the floor, you let something go, it falls to the floor at an accelerated rate. And he comes up with the principle of equivalence that gravity and acceleration are basically equivalent. All the effects of gravity are equivalent to the effects of acceleration. There's no difference between the two. And he comes up with the notion that unlike what Newton told us, that gravity is some mysterious force between two distant objects acting instantly at a distance, that really gravity is just the curving of the fabric of space. He even does that visually by saying, imagine rolling a bowling ball onto a two-dimensional fabric, like a trampoline. It curves the fabric. You roll some billiard balls behind it, they roll, and they start moving towards the bowling ball. Why? Not because, as Newton would tell us, the bowling ball's got some mysterious attraction, but because the bowling balls curve the fabric and the billiard balls roll to it. You and I can see that very clearly, and if you're Einstein, you can see it happening in three dimensions that an object curves all three dimensions of space. And if you're really Einstein, you can imagine it happening in four dimensions because the special theory tells us that there's really four dimensions of space-time. Well, I know that's where we start scratching our heads and stuff, but it is true that even the great physicists of the world couldn't figure it out as he did these two conceptual leaps. These are such imaginative leaps that in 1905, when he does special relativity, he's a patent clerk, as I said. He's a patent clerk still in 1906, and in 1907, in 1908. Muse History of science museums throughout Europe pride themselves on the letters of application from Albert Einstein as a patent clerk that they rejected throughout 1906, 7, and 8. He couldn't get a job. And likewise, in uh, 1915, 1916, when he finally publishes General Rel Relativity, People don't quite get it. They don't quite know what it is. Uh, it's not until he gives an experimental basis for it, which is that the gravity of the sun will bend starlight as it goes past it, and they finally observe that, do people understand that his creativity actually ushered in a new era of science. I talk about this uh, because I do think that we're very smart these days, but in some ways, we've never, we don't have that same sort of creativity. It was something else we talked about at dinner tonight. The creativity doesn't bubble up the way it did, say, in the period of modernism when Einstein is doing special and general relativity. When Evan Thomas and I wrote The Wise Man, it was about a period of starting in 1945 through the 50s in which America suddenly realized that after winning World War II, we faced a whole new global struggle, the threat of Soviet uh, expansion of Soviet communism. And what they did was like what Franklin did. They created a whole new set of institutions that were so creative that we take them for granted now, just like uh, we take for granted the creative institutions that uh, Ben Franklin did. So creative, they were just out of whole cloth. Uh, Dean Acheson said when he entitled, with some humility, his uh, memoirs, President at the Creation, 
that it was like creating a whole new world out of chaos. And what they do is they realize that first they have to explain the new global challenge we face. And so George Kennan and others come up with the containment doctrine and, this, and the explanation of what it is that we're fighting, something we haven't really done today, but explaining that it's the expansion of Soviet-backed communism. They come up with military institutions in order to counter this, NATO and others, CETO, CENTO, in order to figure out how to stop this threat. They realize it's a battle for the economy. So in Bretton Woods, they come up with the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund and the General Agreement on Tariffs, that's now the WTO. They come up with the notion that they have to win the war for the pocketbook. So they come up with the Marshall Plan, something truly creative and ingenious that uh, took a great generation to figure out. And they uh, even uh, war for you know, people's minds with Radio Free Europe and Voice of America. And so you have this whole new set of institutions designed to deal with a new global struggle, all of which come up between 1946 and 1950. They even create the doctrine that balances the commitments and resources in NSC 68. We face a new global struggle now, two new global struggles in a way. The struggle against um, fundamentalist uh, terrorism, or however you want to define it, and also the crisis in the global economy. And I say however you want to define it because we haven't even done the first step that the wise men did in the 1940s. We haven't even defined what our struggle is uh, against terrorism. I mean, war on terrorism is not exactly the best definition of it, but it's the one that the current administration has been using. We have not done the creative conceptualizing about it. We are still using the old institutions, like NATO, which was designed to stop Soviet tanks going through the Volga Gap as our way to uh, deal with some of these things, instead of creating the new military alliances that we need in the Middle East. Anne Marie has written about this a lot. We are still using Voice of American Radio for Europe, instead of getting the people who invented Facebook and Google to figure out new ways of doing through social networking and the internet uh, of making uh, what America stands for uh, available to everybody. Uh, and when you're still using Radio Free Europe, all three of those words feel a bit anachronistic. Instead of calling on Larry Page and uh, Sergey Brin and uh, Mark Zuckerberg to say, give me some of your best people so we can create what would be Radio Free Europe for this current time, it shows a lack of creativity there. And then certainly as you watch the almost embarrassing, you know Washington being embarrassing, you should have been there last week, when the G20, an organization that doesn't quite exist, was causing motorcade lock as they went around like crazy doing absolutely nothing to solve the world economy, we cannot be using the World Bank and the G7 to try to figure out what to do with our economic crisis. And yet, whether it's economic or hearts and minds or philosophical, or militarily, we've invented and been creative in no way, shape, or form uh, like they had been in the 1940s. Um, I do think that there's hope with this new administration, but it is going to be a test not of the intelligence of the new people who come in, but of their creativity. You see that both in Franklin and in Einstein, this notion of trying to think differently, happening all the way throughout their lives. Uh, for Einstein, it was somewhat complex. He moves here to 112 Mercer Street in 1933, and in some ways he remains a rebel because he's fighting the advances in quantum theory that come out of another of his 1905 papers. The notion that with the new quantum mechanics that had come up in the 1920s, that there's an uncertainty inherent at the subatomic level that things happen by chance, that Heisenberg talks about an uncertainty principle, and Niels Bohr talks about probabilities of what happens instead of laws that directly relate what's happening. And Einstein rebelled against that as well. He kept fighting, saying, I cannot believe that God plays dice with the universe. Um, at one point, Niels Bohr, having heard that line far too many times, finally said, Einstein, please quit telling God what to do. But you have it ingrained here, I think on, um, what's the old math building here? Which hall is that? Jones Hall. Jones Hall. Above the mantelpiece is the, 
where the title of uh, Abraham Pye's book comes from. They come in and tell him something about an experiment that actually shows that he's been wrong on something. And he says, subtle is the Lord, but malicious he is not. He knows that there are laws that govern the universe, even if we're in an era of quantum mechanics. It's now carved on that mantelpiece there. So Einstein is here totally rebellious throughout that entire period. He's written the letter with Wigner and Teller and Szilard to tell Franklin Roosevelt to build an atom bomb or to explain that an atom bomb can be built. And as the atom bomb is used, he rebels against the notion of nationalism and people having bombs. And he comes up with a whole new creative way of looking at the world, a creative way of having a grand world federalism in which you won't have nation states with their own armies and bombs, but that there will be a global federation that will handle all nuclear weapons. That was considered incredibly naive, and he was ridiculed for it, and perhaps it was naive. But as he said when they asked him about that, he said, well, how do you think World War III will be fought? He said, I don't know, but I know how World War IV will be fought with sticks and rocks. And so maybe at some point people will catch up as they did with his other series and think that it's naive to allow nation states each to create their own nuclear weapons with the rivalries that nation states have. So he dedicates himself for the final years of his life here in Princeton to fighting for a universal world order that will overcome uh, the rivalries in the nuclear age. And second great thing that he does is he keeps struggling alone to come up with the unified field theory that will overcome the uncertainties at the heart of quantum mechanics. And everybody says he's wasting his time but once again, he's just questioning what everybody is taking as a matter of assumption. He failed. We have yet to come up with a unified field theory. It may turn out that God does play dice. But at some point, a century or two from now, if they ever do find a theory that ties together all the forces of nature and removes the uncertainty at the subatomic level, we'll say, yes, his creativity and rebelliousness was just as good as ever, but a little bit ahead of his time. And even... On his, you know, dying days, he's uh, still walking every day from Mercer Street to the Institute of Advanced Study. Uh, every day, puttering around, doing those uh, field equations like the little kid marveling at why the compass needle points north. Until finally he hemorrhages. He has an aneurysm. It bursts. They take him to the hospital here, Princeton Hospital. Rush people in from New York who talk about having an operation. He says, no, my time has come. Let's not prolong it artificially. And so in that last day there in Princeton Hospital, he does three things. He finishes and signs the Einstein Bertrand Russell Manifesto calling for world peace in an atomic age. And then while his family is there, he's been asked to give a big speech on the radio. And he knows he'll never live to be able to deliver it. But he writes the first sentence because he wants to make it clear it was supposed to be about the anniversary of the State of Israel, but he wanted to make it clear that it was going to be instead about the need for world peace in the atomic age. So he writes that first sentence. He says, I speak to you today not as a Jew and not as an American citizen, but as a human being. And then the pain becomes too great and he puts it aside. But late that night, when nobody is there, he apparently revives and he reaches over to his bedside table on that last night. He doesn't pick up the speech again. He picks up 12 pages he had brought with him from his office at the Institute that are just equations. He's still doing the equations, trying to find the unified field theory. And the last page, which you have, uh, it, it's both in, there's a copy of it here at, uh, in Princeton and one at Hebrew University. You just see the line after line of equations, very tightly written, making some math mistakes as usual and crossing them out and fixing them until sudden, soon the lines become kind of wavering and they get a little bit further spaced apart as the pain becomes too great. And finally, you watch as he writes one last line of equations that dribbles off, one last line that he thought would get him and the rest of us just one step closer to what he called the spirit manifest in the laws of the universe. And that's how a very rebellious and creative patent clerk became the mind reader of the creator of the cosmos and the locksmith of the mysteries of the atom and the universe. And as for Franklin, he too at the very end, is still doing the things most important to him. Uh, at age 80, at the Constitutional Convention, 82 actually, he's twice as old as the other members. He's nearing the end of his life. 
And he just sits there quietly as a whole convention breaks down over the big states versus little states and the Connecticut Compromise goes down in flames. And he's sitting there being creative, trying to figure out the new institutions. And so finally, near the end, he gets up and he gives a last great speech in which he says, um, I'm much older than everybody in this room, but the older I get, something very unusual happens to me. I realize I've been wrong at times and that other people have been right. He says, it's going to happen to you. You're going to get older and realize you may have been wrong at times and other people may have been right. So why don't you look at the people next to you and see if we can find a creative new structure for making things work. And he proposes the uh, motion to have a, both a House and a Senate, equal votes per state, proportional representation. He tells them to line up, and most of them do. And when they do, uh, he points to the back of Washington's chair. He said, I often wondered whether that was a rising sun or setting sun on the back of General Washington's chair. But now I know it's a rising sun. And Mrs. Powell, one of the great old ladies of Philadelphia, rushes up as they open the door and says, what have you given us in there? What have you created for us? And he says, a republic, madam, if you can keep it. Because he knew it was up to each one of us, we the middle people, the middle class, who would ha be able to be creative and keep those balances you need to keep a republic alive. During his lifetime, he donated to the building fund of each and every church that was built in Philadelphia. And at one point, they built what's called the New Hall. If you go over to Philadelphia and you look just to the left of Independence Hall, there's a building that's so called the New Hall. And he wrote the fundraising document because it was for, to be a place where itinerant preachers of the Great Awakening who were traveling around could come preach if they didn't have a pulpit. And the fundraising document begins by saying, even if the Mufti of Constantinople were to send somebody here to preach Islam to us and teach us about Muhammad, we should have a pulpit we can offer to them so that we can listen and we can learn. And on his deathbed, he's the largest individual contributor to the Mikveh Israel Synagogue, the first synagogue built in Philadelphia. And so when he dies, instead of his minister accompanying his casket to the grave, all 35 ministers, preachers, and priests of Philadelphia link arms with the rabbi of the Jews to march with him to the grave. It's that type of creativity, of tolerance, of looking for new ways of doing things that they were fighting for back in Franklin's time. And I really do think that's a struggle we're fighting for both at home and in the world today. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Very up for so Thank you. Okay. I'm happy to do questions, and I know there are people running with mics, right. so and you can ahead. ask about anything. It doesn't have to be about the math of general relativity. If it is about foreign policy, I'm going to make Anne Marie answer it, and if it's about history, I'm going to make Sean, and if it's about, you know, journalism and politics and the wise men, I'll make Evan do it, and I'll see if I can get out unscathed. But if you, if you want to ask a question, wait till the guy sprints to you, and then... Sprint? All right. We'll do a few minutes sprint. of questions. Questions? All right. A Princeton class, no question. <laughs> After the professor. There's a gentleman in the way back behind you. Yes. I, I wonder if you would comment on the relationship of both Einstein and Franklin to women. Right. My wife, who is sitting on the front row, asked me, why do you keep writing about people who are really mean to their wives, abandon them, and are nasty to their children? And I said, well, gee, it's good that I get it out on the page. And you know, I know. Um, Both of them are not, never win Husband of the Year Award. Um, Einstein, uh, I'll give you the tale. I mean, Einstein has this amazing first wife who he meets at the Zurich Polytech. A woman who is the only woman in the class of math and physics at the Zurich Polytech. Back then, women were not thought able to do math and physics all that well, unlike today at Harvard where they know that that's different. But her father was an army officer from Zagreb uh, uh, and uh, Serbia at the time, and he was able to get her into the Zurich Polytech. And she and Einstein fall madly in love. Uh, it's a tumultuous relationship 
They're both sets of parents are against it. I mean, she's Serbian, Christian, Orthodox, you know, Orthodox, uh, Eastern Orthodox, and he's Jewish, and both parents forbid the marriage. So, of course, they go off. They go hiking around Lake Como. He gets her pregnant. They have an illegitimate child, a daughter, who's somewhat lost to history, although I deal with it in the book some. Uh, it is a very tumultuous relationship. They finally do get married, but proving Einstein's mother right, proving that all Jewish mothers are right, the marriage is a horrible marriage. After he gets sort of finished with relativity, they hardly speak to each other. And finally, he says to her at one point, um, he wants a divorce, but he doesn't have any money. I mean, he still hasn't you know, been recognized or anything. He says to her, one of these days, one of those papers, meaning the 1905 papers, will win the Nobel Prize. If you give me a divorce, I will give you the money. Now, that's huge. I mean, you know, this is like a few people here have won Nobel Prizes, but, you know, Al Gore did not offer this to Tipper. This is a big <laughs> offer. And she takes a week to think about it. She, she consults with Fritz Haber and uh, a couple of other scientists that she knows, and she finally takes the bet. Now, you know, as I say, the paper was written in 1905. Nobody recognizes his genius. Well, it's not until 1922 that they announce his Nobel Prize. But at that point, uh, they've been divorced, but she finally gets all the money and she buys three apartment buildings in Zurich, at which point Einstein then marries his first cousin, who basically just cooks for him the rest of his life. Franklin had a common law marriage with Deborah Reed, common law because she had been married before and her husband had banned it. So all this is very dysfunctional. What's very interesting on the Franklin front is the son, because um, he has this illegitimate son. They all have illegitimate children. Uh, named William Franklin. And unlike Einstein, Benjamin Franklin takes responsibility of the son, raises the son, dotes on the son, educates, brings the son to England when Franklin becomes the envoy over there before the revolution. And uh, despite the fact that, or maybe because of the fact that he's a bastard born, he becomes very aristocratic, William Franklin. Loves the royalty and dukes and all that. And Franklin is very anti-royalist. As you know from living here in New Jersey, William Franklin finally uh, gets a job as royal governor of New Jersey and moves back here to Princeton and then finally to, I think, Perth is where they set up before Perth and Amboy were won. So Frank, William Franklin is this great royalist and there's this great rift between the two of them. In fact, if you want to understand that wonderful scene in the autobiography I talked about, where he straggles up Market Street with the three rolls in his pocket, you just have to read the first two words of the autobiography, which are, Dear Son. It's a tale to say, remember your roots. Remember where you came from. We're not an aristocratic nation here. We're proud of being hardworking and up from rags to riches. William Franklin has none of that. They split up. When Franklin comes back in 1775, everybody's waiting to see if he's going to join the side of the revolution or stay loyal to the crowd. First, he meets with William. Uh, Franklin, uh, in Bucks County, uh, halfway in between here in Philadelphia. And interestingly, there's a third person there, a 17-year-old kid named Temple Franklin, because William had an illegitimate child. I mean, this is great dysfunctional families. Uh, it's a soap <laughs> opera. But William had not raised Temple Franklin. He had just put him out to foster care and pretty much forgotten him. But when William leaves to become governor of New Jersey, Benjamin Franklin goes and finds the grandson, Temple, and raises him in his household in London and brings him back. And so they're all three at the summit and they all sort of struggle. William decides to stay loyal to the crown. Benjamin Franklin becomes a rebel and joins the Continental Congress in Philadelphia. And Temple decides to side with the grandfather. So it's all this sturm and drang going all the way through to the very end after Franklin leaves France in the 1780s to sail back he and Temple, his grandson, stop to see William in England, and they disinherit him and say they'll have that. You know, so it's all this thing. I, you know, the only thing I can say is these are human beings. And, you know, when you write a biography, you're tempted to say, gee, that's bad. Why are they so bad to their kids, their wives, or whatever? But it doesn't really diminish them to say, well, these are flesh and blood people. They are actually real. They fight with their kids. They get divorced or estranged from their wives. And uh, it's not exactly pretty, and it probably does say that ego and uh, selfishness can creep in when you get to be too famous or too great. But, uh, you know, I, I don't really know. I'm not the great analyst of all this. I just try to tell the tale, and I think it tries to remind people that uh, when you're talking about it, even an Einstein or even a Franklin, 
They're not made of marble on some pedestal. They're flesh and blood people have their own sins. I mean, I remember being out in Aspen and somebody asked a question with an edge like, I mean, like your question, but did it with an edge. Like, how could you like him when he was so mean to his kids or whatever? And I'm looking at this guy who was asking me the question. He's like on his third trophy wife and can't remember the names of all of his kids. And I just said, yeah, did you ever know anybody like that? And so <laughs> it's what biography is about. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. The question is, in what ways does our society encourage creativity and which ways does it stifle it? We're talking about creativity and science a lot, which is why I wrote this book. I am not a scientist, but I believe science and math are unbelievably creative and beautiful endeavors. And in my age cohort, meaning sort of uh, people born right before Sputnik, but after Einstein made math and science seem too complicated, people who were not mathematicians and scientists sort of felt intimidated by math and science. And if I may say so, mathematicians and scientists were sort of part of a priesthood and they didn't really, if when I went to college, I was doing the humanities, if I wandered into a physics class, I wouldn't have felt as embraced, you know, just you know, going to try to do physics as a physics major would if he had wandered into a Shakespeare class. You sort of would feel intimidated by the priesthood of great science. And so I think now we've gotten to a stage with no child left behind and education and stuff where we've suddenly discovered we're going to lose in this world if our kids don't know science and math. So we try to cram science and math into their head, do a lot of high stakes testing on science and math, not teach it all that creatively, but worse yet, we as parents, if we aren't scientists or uh, uh, mathematicians, we kind of outsource this. We want the teachers to teach it, but we don't sit around saying, gee, this science is so interesting and so fascinating. You know, we'll take our kids to baseball games or even to Shakespeare or even read with them or you know, novels with them, but we don't talk about science as being part of the creativity and the wonders of growing up. Because we, and when I say we, I include half of this room, but I mean people who are not naturally scientists. I didn't want that to happen. My da our daughter is very interested in science and math and I wanted to keep encouraging that, but I wanted her to see it as just as creative as Shakespeare. You know, I have a lot of friends who would never admit that they don't know the difference between Hamlet and Macbeth, but would happily brag that they don't know the difference between relativity theory and uncertainty principle. Or would happily say, I don't know the difference between a gene and a chromosome. And I say, well, you know, you really should. Uh, genetics is very creative, uh, and, you know, science is creative, physics is... And they'd say, yeah, but I love Shakespeare. And i say, yeah, did you see, you know, the Hamlet that Michael Kahn did at uh, Shakespeare Theater? they say, oh, yeah, I love Hamlet. And then I'll say, yeah, but did Hamlet love Ophelia? And they'll say, gee, I don't know, it's complicated. I said, yeah, but we can appreciate Shakespeare even though he's complicated. He's actually more complicated than most of science. We should also appreciate the beauty and creativity and complexities of science. And so I blame it partly on a generation of people who want their kids to know science but don't celebrate the creativity of science. Yes, sir. Who would you identify as uh, wise men or women today, if there are any? How, how do you answer this? <laughs> Ask Evan. He wrote the good parts of the book. Um, I actually think, I'll give an answer on foreign policy first. Um, our foreign policy has gotten polarized, ideological, and the notion and Benjamin Franklin once says, compromisers don't make great heroes, but they do make great democracies. This notion that we can be pragmatic and have a realist foreign policy has been pushed aside, by, you know, even by Bush or by the left at times. And I think that we need a dose of realism in dealing with the world the way it is. And there are certain realists. Brent Scowcroft comes to mind. Colin Powell comes to mind. Uh, Bill Perry comes to mind. Anne-Marie, who else do we have in there in that sort of to me, the realist school of, you know, Kissinger, I know, well, yeah. Uh, I, I do think that it would be nice to bring those people back. The Obama campaign has brought a whole lot of people in on a transition, not a transition team, but a 
some great Poobah panel, including people like Bill Perry, but they haven't made much use of that group yet. Um, clearly, we need it also in global finance and, uh, you know, the Bob Rubin, Larry Summers types. But I don't think we celebrate as much as we should people who rise above partisanship in politics. In Evans' part of The Wise Men, there's a wonderful scene, I think, you know, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, which Bob Lovett, who is then Under Secretary of State, uh, goes up to Harry Truman and describes the Marshall Plan and why we need to do the Marshall Plan, et cetera. And he says something along the lines of, and we're, you know, we're going to do this plan to rebuild Europe, but it's not going to be called the Truman Plan, they tell him it should be called the Marshall Plan, uh, because that would rise above politics. If we called the Truman Doctrine, the Truman Plan, it wouldn't. And Truman says, yes, yes, I get it. If we call it the Truman Plan, those damn Republicans will be out to get us, at which point Lovett says, you forget, Mr. President, I am one of those damn Republicans. <laughs> and that was a period in which people could sort of forget which party you were in when it came to creating foreign policy. Yes, Sam. I'm curious, I'm just thinking about partisanship, and I'm also thinking about um, the, your major theme tonight, creativity. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, um, one thing about when people talk about getting away from partisanship, it, it seems to be looking for agreed upon ideas. But I don't think that Einstein spent all that much time, for instance, looking for common ideas with the people who are wrong or stodgy in their thinking. So right, there's a very good Yeah, basically the question is. Franklin in particular and the wise men trying to find common ground as a way of being realist, whereas Einstein, of course, doesn't. And that's an interesting difference in theme, one I try to explore in the Einstein book, because I wrote it after Franklin book, which is physicists, especially theoretical physicists, there's no advantage to compromise. You can't say, uh, you know, let's go halfway in between your theory and mine and see if we can find a common ground. One is right, one is wrong. And so finding common ground is not as valuable in physics. On the other hand, thinking totally differently and out of the box, where you have two conflicting theories that can't be reconciled, you know, Maxwell's equations, concepts, and you find some new way of going over it, the best example is also 1905, when the kid stole a patent clerk. He's looking at, at the whole notion of light, and uh, the fact that it's a wave, as he's said in special relativity. And yet, if you look at the way that light hits, say, iron and heats it up and bounces off, you have what's called a photoelectric effect, in which light seems like it behaves as if it's a particle. And everybody's trying to compromise, find the common ground. And Einstein says, no, light is both wave and particle. It's not sort of halfway in between. Even though those are two contradictory things, Light is both wave and particle. And so it's, uh, it's a way of looking at things creatively when you have a conflict. But there's a role of coming up with an idea for an individual to come in and present the new ideas, and then if that person leads sufficiently, then people perhaps on different sides can agree. So for instance, to pick a very recent example, Obama is now talking about energy security as something that's vital for economic security and national security. Mm -hmm. And he's connecting these dots in a way that, you know, that if you think about it, it's true, but he's He's making, he's pounding in the idea that these things fit together. So I'm just wondering, you know, whether there's a role for people to come in and stick things together and then maybe yeah. a second stage of, of, of reaching agreement on that. Right. I mean, there's in some ways two types of great leaders. Those who can make the distinctions and those that can pull things together. And you can do it the way Clinton did, which is sort of triangulate and some would say split the difference. Or you can try to do it in a way that's more creative like Einstein would with light and wave and particle, and maybe Obama will when he's got conflict. You're going to have conflicts, though, on energy security, which he doesn't talk about as much, but drilling in the United States helps you achieve energy security because you're not as dependent on foreign oil, but it certainly doesn't help on the climate change front. And so what happens when two things conflict? And frankly, I do not know. We were talking about education reform, something I care deeply about. And there are two major camps in the education movement. Either those who believe, like Michelle Rhee in Washington and Joel Klein in New York, that you have to hold teachers accountable, do merit pay, allow choice, uh, and, you know, and those who are more supportive of the unions who say that the traditionalist, more progressive structure works. And will Obama try to split the difference? Will he try to find some weird common ground? Or will he be tough enough? 
You know, the toughest thing we face in life is when to be, as I said, Franklin was, finding common ground, that compromise, and when to stand true to principle and not compromise and be on your And Franklin gets it wrong once. At that Constitutional Convention, he makes the compromise he knows he shouldn't make. He compromises on the issue of slavery. And he feels horrible about it afterwards. He always keeps a list of all the errors he made in his life and how he rectified it, like running away from his brother and he rectified it by educating his brother's son. But at the end of his life, he's got this great sin that he compromised on slavery when he should have held true to principle. So he becomes the president of the Society for the Abolition of Slavery at age 82. I mean, you know, pretty old back then. And what we do in life, in politics, and in probably any creative endeavor or whatever, is to try to figure out when do you stand true to your principle and when do you try to find common ground and compromise. And there's no formula. If there were, we wouldn't have to write long biographies. We could just write short ones. And even great people like Benjamin Franklin sometimes get it wrong. But him wrestling with it is one of the great themes of that dichotomy between standing true to principle versus finding the tolerance for other people's principles. When are you tolerant of other people's principles, and when do you say, no, I'm not going to be tolerant of that principle? Sorry, yes, sir. Hmm. Let me get him and then the gentleman here. So actually, let me start with him, because he's got the mic, and then we'll bring it to you. Yeah. Possessions, nine-tenths of the question. <laughs> if, um, I don't mean to be a smart ass about this, but what's so great about creativity in the current environment? The two major problems that are facing us, as you describe them, one being the rise of fundamentalism, the other being the financial crisis. The financial crisis is a, entirely attributable to creativity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And um, fundamentalism is outside the realm of creativity because it's predicated on creativity uh, and the ignorance of reality. So, so to start you, with the fundamentalist, to me, the basic tenet of creativity is some form of openness and tolerance. You're open to some new ideas. And the struggle in this world between the fundamentalists and the people who are open is the great, I think, political or political philosophical divide. When you get to the financial crisis, you're right. Somebody who is some smart kid who created derivatives is not exactly the hero of this world. And frankly, creativity can lead, it's value neutral, meaning whatever we create is only as good or as bad as we make use of it. So creativity can create bad things as well as good things. But at this moment, we are facing a meltdown of astonishing proportions that has rumbled everywhere except for perhaps through the walls of Princeton, where everywhere you go from a car dealership in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina to Wall Street, things are really in a mess, and they are trying vaguely to reshape the G8 or, and to put the you know, Brazil and Russia into it and you know, create a G20, and they have no creative institution for dealing with these things. By creative, I sometimes mean just creating the right institutions, the way Franklin did, the way the wise men did. We are hopeless in dealing with this crisis, it seems. And it's not because we're not smart, it's just because we're trying to make NATO fight wars in Iran and Iraq, and the World Bank and IMF try to deal with monetary issues that go far beyond. We, we have just not shown the institutional creativity that a previous generation did. But I agree on uh, derivatives. I'm not going to defend them. Well, if you work on the assumption that every panic, whether it's financial or political, sure. is driven by the immediate return to fundamental concepts, that a deviation from reality that's taken place over years is corrected mm -hmm. in such a short period of time that everybody needs to recalibrate faster than they're yeah. able to. Does that require creativity, or does that require um, really nothing more than the leadership back to core values? Yeah. Well, it's a good question, and I'm not sure I'm the best here to answer it since I, I don't own the financial crisis. But I am glad you raised the question. And obviously, core values and some creative new institutions would be useful. Right down here. Yeah. Out of all the 
Henry Kissinger. Kissinger. I did Kissinger because we had done the wise men and it ends in Vietnam, basically, with the wise men gathering in Vietnam. I was trying to figure out a way to do America's role in the world in the Vietnam period. Having worked at Time Magazine, you were kind of taught, we'll tell the history of that time through the people who make it. And Kissinger was very instrumental there, and he had aroused such emotions that everything written about Kissinger almost was either incredibly unfavorable or hagiography. And I thought the time had come, people were still alive, I can explain what they were talking about, but they're old enough that their ambitions had waned and their papers were becoming available, that you could do it through Henry Kissinger. And so I tried to do a book that was fair and straight down the middle about Henry Kissinger. At which point, in trying to get me fired after the book came out, he told my editor, Henry Grunwald, what right does that young man have to be fair and straight down the middle about a person like me? <laughs> so having to deal with Kissinger after that book came out, my first thought was, next time I'm going to do somebody who's been dead for 200 years. <laughs> I also wanted to understand the, ru the role of realism, as I discussed earlier, in American foreign policy. Because Kissinger was, at heart, as Anne Marie said, a realist, balance of power theorist. We don't have those in America except for Benjamin Franklin. He's there in Paris, and he's doing a great balance of power game, writing you know, memos to Verjean, the French foreign minister, about the Bourbon Pact nations of France, Netherlands, Spain, why it's in their interest and the struggles against England to come in on our side of the revolution. It was a triumph of both realism and idealism, because he builds himself a printing press and prints the Declaration of Independence. So I wanted to get him as a diplomat. And the only great biography of Franklin was uh, Carl Van Doren, which is just awesome, written in, I think, 30, 1938. But it's written by an English professor who doesn't really do much on the diplomacy or the science. So I got interested in Franklin and did that. As for Einstein, because I discovered that Franklin was a real scientist and it tied into everything he did, that he wasn't some doddering old dude flying a kite in the rain, but that the electricity experiments were the most important experiments and the theory that comes out of it is a single fluid theory of electricity. It's the most important theory of that time and it ties in, as Sean Wilentz will explain to you next lecture, even with the whole notion of how you build a republic and things. To me, that was totally fascinating and I was so interested in the science that I thought would be nice to try to tackle a scientist. And also we were making Einstein person of the year and all the books I, a person of the century and all the books I read I couldn't quite figure out. So I decided to do that. Last question there. Art and creativity. Yes, I mean, creativity is about the imagination and one of the things I was talking about, we were talking earlier this evening and that I'm very interested in, is why a burst of creativity happens in a variety of fields at the same time, where people break classical bonds. Between 1905, when he does special relativity, and 1915, when he does general, you see an explosion of people questioning the whole notion of time and space whether it's uh, New Descending a Staircase or Damasel d'Avignon or any of Kandinsky, Picasso, whatever you want it to be. You see the breaking of the classical order, whether it's Schoenberg or Stravinsky. You see Proust and um, Joyce breaking the bonds of time, being absolute. Uh, and so, to me, that's utterly fascinating about how a certain creative mindset can hit at a certain point. <laughs> And it's not as if Einstein is sitting there with Diaghilev and Picasso and Stravinsky at the opening of the Rites of Spring and saying, hey, let's all mess with the notion of time. But it's happening, and I don't know. That is something that is much better studied here in the academy, which is why does creativity in a certain way flower in a different set of fields and seem to reverberate uh, with each other? So what, they, what they all had was a lot of structure to work against Right. You're breaking classical bonds in all cases. And you see three great periods where things like that happen. The Renaissance, the Enlightenment, and what I'll call the birth of modernism. And that gets back to what is the true root of creativity. And for me, it involves being slightly rebellious, questioning the classical order and saying, okay, these bonds that have been our strictures for, you know, a couple of centuries, why do we have to obey those bonds? 
can't we question the premise, challenge the assumption, and uh, break the strictures? And um, that's what we haven't been doing much of, really, I don't think, these days. Thank you all very much.